Good morning. morning. Hey, what a joy to be gathered with all of you here on this beautiful Mother's Day morning. So thankful for all the ladies of our congregation and all that you guys do. Uh, If you're a lady in the congregation this morning, would you please stand that we can recognize you? Come on. I want to clap for you. I love you guys. All right, you guys can sit down. Whether you are a biological mother or you are a spiritual mother, uh, we recognize that you have an incredibly vital role in our lives. You have a crucial ministry in God's kingdom, and our lives, they would not be at all the same without you. We know that motherhood is a symbol of sacrifice, and that sacrifice is an image of the gospel. We know that all the ladies of our congregation have made sacrifices on behalf of others. I know it's true of my mom, and I love her, and I miss her, and I'm sure that she will see this. It's true of my children's mother. You guys know her, and it's true of all of you as well. We celebrate and honor you today, ladies, and we say thank you. The scripture says that charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. So we praise the godly women in our lives, and we praise God, and we are thankful for you. So God bless you guys. Well, we are returning today to our study of the Old Testament people of God in exile. We got sidetracked for a little bit with Easter, but that was a great thing because all of this actually points to the the whole purpose for it all, which is the arrival of Christ, his work uh, in the redemption, uh, in his life, death, and resurrection. But we're returning today to our study of strangers in a strange land. Today we'll begin the final portion of this series, and we'll see the return of the Jews to Jerusalem as told in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. In our English translations of the Bible, Ezra and Nehemiah are two separate books, but historically, and in the Hebrew text, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, they are one work, and they tell the story of the slow return of God's people from exile in the Babylonian captivity. After being held as captives in a foreign land under the hand of oppressive and brutal rulers, the decree that the Jews should return home and resettle the land had to have made for an incredibly joyous occasion. From there, we see the book of Ezra Nehemiah is, as Tim Mackey explains, the anatomy and analysis of a revival gone wrong. It's an exposition of a failed revival. Ezra Nehemiah is about the exciting start, the opposition they faced, and then how they worked through that opposition. This reminds me of a story I once heard about a town that uh, they gathered at their high school football field to pray for rain. And living in the desert, you understand this kind of thing. Uh, One of the first things I learned in moving here is that we spend half the year in our prayer meetings praying for rain. But in this particular town, the rains, they had failed. Another year of drought where the crops hadn't made, the land had turned brown to dust and rubble. Those ranchers who were able, they had dug deep into their savings to buy straw to feed their livestock. Trees stood like leafless silhouettes. The cracks in the ground, they were growing wider, and the vultures were beginning to circle to feed on the dying. When distressed and not knowing what else to do, the town gathered at their high school football field to cry out to God and pray for rain. And it was quite an event. Mothers and babies and seniors and children and convertible cars and hot grills and picnic spreads and children's games and all the kinds of things that go along with that. But at the appointed time... They all in unison gathered together, they fell silent, and they turned their thoughts and hopes and needs and pleas to God. They cried out to God to please let it rain. You can imagine their surprise then when God answered their, prayer, their prayers and the heavens broke forth and the rains came pouring down. Ironically, only one man had thought to bring an umbrella. They were prepared that day for everything except what they were praying for. They were asking for rain. They were hoping for rain. And then when they got rain, they learned they weren't really ready for rain. And that's what we'll see with the Hebrew exiles this morning. In their return to Jerusalem, they were faced with the question as to whether they were really ready to receive what they'd been longing and asking God for. We should ask ourselves likewise, are we? In the case of the exiles, they got what they'd been longing for. They got the return home. They got a new beginning. But the restoration of Jerusalem would not be quite what they had expected. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then let's take a look at the return of our ancient brothers and sisters from the exile. Heavenly Father, Lord God, I pray 
that the preaching of your word this morning would be helpful and clear, that you would bless it, that your hand would be upon it, that you would open hearts to receive it. And I pray that the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts would be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. It's by the aid of your spirit and in the matchless authority of your son, to you, Father, we pray, amen. So it's going to take a bit of context to catch us up, to reorient us with the unfolding events of the exile, and to catch us up to Nehemiah and the Jews who have returned to Jerusalem. We need to understand that as, as Daniel was staying in Persia, and later we would see Mordecai and Esther there in Persia, simultaneously, there was a group of Jews that were returning to Jerusalem. This is probably most easily understood as, as two parallel timelines that are running together. God's people who stayed in Persia and God's people who returned to Jerusalem. Now, on the first timeline, you have the kingdom of Israel, you have David and Solomon and the successive kings, and then you have the dispersion to Babylon, and what, what happened in the time of Jeremiah, and Daniel was there in the courts of Babylon. Babylon becomes Persia. In this timeline, the Jews in exile, Daniel and many of the Jews, they stayed in Persia, and even though King Cyrus decreed that the Jews could go back to Jerusalem, in Ezra chapter 1, verse 1, we're told that in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, and also he put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. So Zerubbabel, he leads about 50,000 people, which is a small fraction of the exiles, and they work to rebuild the temple. The rest of the Jews, they remain in Persia in the dispersion. That's why when you read the New Testament, you hear the authors talk about God's people in the dispersion. These are the Jews that remained scattered and didn't return after the exile. So at this point, you have these two parallel timelines. Down here in Persia, you have Daniel serving King Cyrus. He gets thrown in the lion's den, and then later you have Mordecai and Esther. And then up here, you have Zerubbabel, and then Ezra, and Nehemiah, and Malachi, and the returnees working to rebuild Jerusalem. They'll be referred to as the remnant. And their progeny would be the people who Jesus would be born into in Israel. We're told the stories of these returnees to Jerusalem in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, where, as I said, they experience an exciting start, they face fierce opposition, and then they work through that opposition. The people may have expected what the future might look like in returning. They may have anticipated it would be a lot of work. They knew that Jerusalem had been sacked and it had been laid destroyed. But I imagine it a lot like we might imagine the pilgrims felt in escaping religious persecution in Europe to come to the new world. God had blessed them and sent them on a journey into a new beginning to experience freedom and flourishing and faith in a new land. But when they set out on that voyage across the sea, they began with songs of joy. But it wasn't long before they faced shortages of food, the ship started to break apart, the passengers had to work as carpenters to hold the Mayflower together. They faced agonizing delays, and after making landfall and settling in their new home, the 130 passengers of the Mayflower, they contracted illnesses, and by the end of the first winter, all but 53 had died. We know the settling of America would take generations after that. This new beginning, it was a tremendous blessing full of tremendous hope and promise and religious freedom. It would advance the purposes and the kingdom of God, but it's all very similar to what you might expect the people experienced as they resettled Jerusalem. For the returnees, their new beginning was not what they expected. When they returned to Jerusalem in 538 B.C., they saw the condition of Jerusalem. While the youth celebrated and rejoiced, those elders who could recall the temple and Jerusalem before the exile, they sat and they wept. The book of Ezra tells us in chapter 3 that when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and heads of fathers' houses Old men who had seen the first house, that had seen the old temple, they wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of this house being laid. Though many shouted aloud for joy so that the people could not distinguish between the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping. The young people in their joy at this new beginning, they shouted for joy. 
But the elders who had seen the glory days of Jerusalem, they sat and they wept. As R.C. Sproul points out, there was a difference in the generations. The younger people who had come now, they're so thrilled to be out of their captivity and to be involved in this building project and to restore the temple to their nation. But for the elders of the community, for the priests and the Levites, it was a bittersweet moment because they still had a vivid memory of the splendor of the temple that was built by Solomon. Even though this temple was being rebuilt at this time, there's no way it could compare with the splendor and the glory of the Solomonic temple that was built during the golden age of Israel. Instead of rejoicing and sharing, they wept and they cried. But they did come around after a while. And of course, by the time Christ arrives in Jerusalem, the temple which had been updated by Herod by that time was far superior even to that temple of the Golden Age. Sadly, though, for the returnees, this would only be the beginning of the struggle. The building of the temple, it would face a number of delays and a great deal of opposition. It would take the people 20 years to complete the temple, such that it would be completed in 516 B.C., which is exactly 70 years from the beginning of the exile, as Jeremiah had prophesied. The building of the temple, it would only be the beginning of the challenges. Again, the return would be a story of failed revival. The people had expected the return of God's presence and a new prosperity, and it didn't happen in the way that they had anticipated. Then 60 years passed between Ezra chapter 6 and Ezra chapter 7, and in 457 B.C., God raises up another leader to lead a second group of people back to Jerusalem. He raises up Ezra. In the years just after the book of Esther, zeal for God and for God's law spurred Ezra to lead a group of Jews back to Israel during King Artaxerxes' reign over the Persian Empire. Artaxerxes is the son of King Xerxes, who we learned was husband of Esther. And so by this time, Xerxes has been assassinated. His son has avenged his death. And now Artaxerxes sits on the Persian throne, and Ezra chapter 7 tells us that Ezra, he was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses that the Lord the God of Israel had given. And the king granted him all that he asked, for the hand of the Lord was on him. So Ezra was a scribe. He was a theologian. He'd lead a second group of Jews back to Jerusalem to the temple where they would rebuild with the word of God. Ezra was a good man. He was a godly man, a man with a, a zeal for the word of God. Ezra points the people back to the word and the commandments of God. He leads the people back to purity and a clear identity as the people of God. What we learn in, es in uh, Ezra is that uh, in many cases, the Jewish exiles, they had intermarried with the Persians. They had sacrificed their Hebrew identity. They'd had children with Persian spouses, and they'd sacrificed their distinct identity as the people of God. And the children of these marriages, they're the people who will become known as the Samaritans. This is why the Samaritans are so despised by the Jews in the time of Christ, because they're the offspring of the Hebrew people's unfaithfulness in exile. They had intermingled with their pagan neighbors and rather than maintaining their, their Hebrew identity. H.G.M. Williamson explains that the substance of this issue is that some members of the, rel the religious community, basically Jews whose families had previously returned from exile, together with those who had thrown in their lot with them, including even the spiritual leaders, they had both married and adopted some of the religious practices of the rest of the Palestinian population. They had taken on some pagan ideas. Many of the Jews in exile, they'd become unequally yoked, including spiritual leaders. They had married unbelievers and adopted their spiritual ways in the process. Williamson says, it should be noted that marriage with foreigners in itself was not forbidden in the Mosaic law. And indeed, not a few of the patriarchs and other heroes of the faith of Israel are said to have contracted such marriages. Moses himself, for instance. However, there was recognized the particular danger that marriage with the unbelieving neighbors would almost certainly lead to religious apostasy or the adoption of their beliefs. That's what happened. The Israelites had sacrificed their Hebrew identity, their faith identity, by marrying pagans and adopting their spiritual practices. Ezra, he points the Jewish people back to purity, back to a clear covenant identity set apart from their neighbors. But again, while the Jerusalemites experienced a theological revival, their existence among their neighbors and the reestablish of Jerusalem remained plagued with problems. Even with a new theological and religious resurgence, the story of the Jews' return to Jerusalem remained one of failed revival. 
Ezra tells us that those who returned from the exile, they were plagued with trouble by the people of the land, the people of the region who had never been exiled but had remained in the land and were now opponents to the work of the rebuilding of Jerusalem. Those returning, they were attempting to, to establish their new identity as the people of God through worship. They faced tremendous trouble from their neighbors. As one commentary highlights, with no military, no walls, no protection, bullies shoved around God's defenseless people in Jerusalem. The people were dedicated to God, but with the walls down, they hid away in fear, and they were continually demoralized as they remained under attack and didn't experience the resurgence that they had hoped for. As N.T. Wright explains, in, in the common Second Temple perception of its own period of history, most Jews of this period, it seems, would have answered the question, where are we? In language which reduced to its simplest form meant we are still in exile. They believed that in all senses which mattered, Israel's exile was still in progress. Part of the myth of the Persian benevolence in sending them back to Jerusalem is the idea of an end of the exile in 539. But all that ended was the Neo-Babylonian hegemony to be replaced by that of the Persians. Ezra would point out in his public prayer that the Jewish people were slaves in our own land under the Persians. What's clear is that even after the return of the Jews from Babylon, Israel remained captive to foreigners. And while the Israelites returned to Jerusalem, they remained a defeated people under slavery of an oppressive foreign empire and under constant attack from their neighbors. That's where God raises up Nehemiah. And Nehemiah was not the savior of God's people, but Nehemiah was God's man for the moment. He was a leader called to God to help bring about the resurgence of God's people in the land. So go ahead and turn in your Bibles to chapter 1 of Nehemiah, because we're going to do some reading there. And we'll learn there that Nehemiah, he wasn't a scribe or a priest or a theologian. He wasn't just a builder or a political leader. But Nehemiah was a student of Scripture and biblical history. He recounted the conditions of Israel's covenant with God from the days of Moses. And he was praying and fasting both day and night. In chapter 1 of Nehemiah, we learn that he was working in the court of the Persian king Artaxerxes, but his thoughts and prayers were continuously with Jerusalem. His heart was devoted to the Lord, and his focus was constantly on God's people there. Take a look with me at chapter 1, verse 1, where Nehemiah writes, Now it happened in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Susa the citadel. Notice he's serving in Susa. That's the same city where we found Mordecai and Esther. And Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. These men had been in Jerusalem. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And Nehemiah says, they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. So we see that even after 60 years of the Hebrews being back in Jerusalem, the conditions are now worse than ever. With no walls and no gates to protect the city, the people were helpless and under attack. And Nehemiah says, as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and I wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. We see that despite being far removed from God's people in Jerusalem, Nehemiah had a great burden for God's people there. His heart was with them and he'd been fervently praying for them. And he says he continued to pray for them. In the following verses, he prays prayers of adoration to the Lord, reverence, prayers of confession, repentance, pleas, and petition on behalf of God's people. Then we learn in the very last phrase of chapter 1, Nehemiah says, Now I was cupbearer to the king. In verse 1 of chapter 2, he says, In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. So, several things that we learn here. First, Nehemiah works in very close proximity to the Persian king. He's the king's wine taster. He's charged with protecting the king. So he's in the king's presence multiple times every day. The king trusts him and he knows him. Second, we see the king he's serving is Artaxerxes. Again, this is King Xerxes of the book of Esther's son. Third, he tells us this is the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign. In the book of Ezra, we're told that Ezra and the group that he led, they went to Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes' reign. So this is 13 years from the time that Ezra and that group had set out for Jerusalem. And we see that Nehemiah knows that group. He knows that group of Hebrews, and it's that group for which he's concerned, and he's, he's praying for them. And he says, this is the month of Nisan. 
So it's been three months since he received the report about Jerusalem in chapter one. So three months he's been grieving and praying about the situation of Ezra and his Hebrew brethren in Jerusalem. In verse two of chapter two, Nehemiah writes, the king said to me, why is your face sad seeing as you're not sick? This is nothing but sadness of the heart. And Nehemiah says, then I was very much afraid. So after three months of grieving, Nehemiah, he's not able to keep this grief inside anymore. Nehemiah was afraid. Because you remember from Daniel, the, the kings, they, they chose only the smartest and most attractive uh, servants for their courts, and they expected the servants to be happy and pleasant and to serve them. Remember Esther, King Xerxes' wife, uh, she feared she'd be e uh, executed for approaching the king uninvited. And now Nehemiah, he's taken the notice of the king for the wrong reasons. And the king asked him, what's wrong, Nehemiah? You're obviously uh, sick at heart. What is it? And Nehemiah, in his concern that the king will think he's not grateful for the king's provision or for his position, he says, verse 3, O king, live forever. Long live the king. But then, boldly, he says, don't take offense at what I'm about to say, but why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire. And Artaxerxes responds, what is it that you're requesting? Nehemiah says, so I prayed to the God of heaven. He was praying before he got the news about Jerusalem. He's been praying for three months since he got that news. And now, before speaking, he prays again one more time. You get the impression that prayer is a crucial part of who Nehemiah was. He said to the king, verse 5, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah to the city of my father's graves that I may rebuild it. And the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, how long will you be gone and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. And you notice next, in verse 7, Nehemiah doesn't stop with the king's approval. Nehemiah has been preparing for the moment, showing us that waiting for God's timing, it's time for praying and planning and preparing. Nehemiah had spent years in service and months here specifically praying and planning for the day when God would call his name and open the door for him to step into this work. Seeing the opening, Nehemiah proposes his plan. He says, if it pleases the king, let letters be given me to the governors of the province beyond the river, that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the, keep, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress of the temple and for the wall of the city and for the house that I shall occupy. And the king granted me what I asked for, for the good hand of my God was upon me, Nehemiah says. What we see with Nehemiah is that he was a man who was not only favored by God, but he was perfectly and prayerfully prepared. He had a plan in preparation of God moving to open doors for him. He had sought God and he knew what to do. Nehemiah had been dependent in prayer and deliberate in planning. Nehemiah showed, as one commentator says, that to be used by God, we need the boldness that Nehemiah showed. But to be effective, we need the discernment to recognize when it's time to talk and when it's time to be quiet. And Nehemiah's wisdom was guided by prayer. He prayed. He was, he was given a vision. It was precise. When God softened the king's heart, he was ready to introduce and execute that precise plan. For years, he sat in silent servitude in a foreign land, waiting for the moment to become that prayerfully prepared, spirit-led powerhouse to lead the people of God for the glory of God. One commentator points out, Nehemiah, it's interesting, he never asked the king for advice because he'd already spent hours and months asking the Lord. And in verse 13, we see that upon arriving in Jerusalem, Nehemiah, he made an inspection of the city. Before doing anything else, he surveys the situation. He says in verse 13, I went out by night by the valley gate to the dragon spring and to the dung gate, and I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. Then I went on to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal that was under me to pass. Then I went up in the night by the valley and inspected the wall, and I turned back and entered by the valley gate and so returned. The officials didn't know where I had gone or what I was doing. I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest who were to do the work. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we're in. 
how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come and let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. He found the city in horrific shape, and Nehemiah recognized this work was not going to be easy. Jerusalem laid in ruin, exposed to the enemy. Nehemiah was going to have to rebuild more than just the city walls. He was going to have to rebuild the people and the community. That's what we're going to see next week. Nehemiah and the people of God, they would face great opposition to the work that God was going to do there. But Nehemiah, he'd sought the face of the Lord. He had reassurance that God was in it and that God was with them. Verse 18, Nehemiah says, I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good and also of the words that the king had spoken to me and they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. But there would be opposition. And the opposition would be fierce. Chapter 2, verse 19 says, But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant and Geshem the Arab heard of it, they jeered at us and despised us. Here we see the first specific mention of the opposition that Nehemiah will face. And this particular opposition, it comes from within the community. This opposition, it will play out over the course of the next several chapters we're going to see. The most troubling issue we'll learn is that Nehemiah will face opposition from some claiming themselves to be the people of God, the people of God pursuing this new work of God. They were going to face opposition from within their own community. We'll learn there were enemies of God and of the restoration of Jerusalem working even within the very priesthood there in Jerusalem. In chapter 13, verse 28, we'll see Nehemiah says, I, I chased them from me. It says, remember them, O my God, because they desecrated the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood, and thus I cleansed them from us. There were religious people who stood against the restoration work, and Nehemiah was given the grace to identify them and to drive them out. R.C. Sproul explains that in carefully and prayerfully planning and surveying the whole condition of Jerusalem, Nehemiah understands not only does he have to rebuild the wall, he has to rebuild the nation. He has to rebuild the people. And after the wall is completed, the task hasn't yet been completed because what Nehemiah embarks upon is a thoroughgoing reformation of the life of his people. With Zerubbabel, the simple rebuilding of the temple was a start, but it wasn't enough. And with Ezra, the rededication to the study of the word, it was crucial, but the lack of the total development of the city and the true establishment of the people as a stronghold in relation to their neighbors had still left the people weak and vulnerable and openly exposed to the attack of the enemy. They were dying. What God had granted Nehemiah to understand was the work of restoration was far more nuanced. It would require a rededication to the Lord. It would require rebuilding. It would require a cleansing of the priesthood and a driving out of the opponents of the work of God within their very midst. Sproul says if the nation was going to start again and have a new vision of their mission for which they were established in the first place, not only did they have to rebuild the temple, they had to cleanse the temple. And they had to cleanse themselves. They had to purify their church that the church could be the church as God intended it to be. Nehemiah will show himself to be a man of God prepared to receive what he's prayed for. Raised up by God and given the vision to be God's man for the task. In all of this, what we see is that new beginnings, revival, rebuilding, they are not easy. They take a movement of God. They require the strength of God. And we must be prayerfully prepared when God opens the door and when God moves. Nehemiah was called of God and prepared by God to be God's man for the moment because God has a plan and God provides. Because God had a great work in store for his people when they would give themselves over to his will and follow his plan. God has a plan for each of us. He's calling each of us to give our lives over to him in Christ, to follow his plan for our redemption in our faith in the life, death, and resurrection of his son and to pursue his will for each of us. And if you hear that today, if your heart has been moved to the place where you understand that, you're ready to place your hope in the Lord, to submit yourself to him and to follow his plan for you, come forward and let it be known that you're ready to give your whole self to following Christ's will for your life that you may be restored. If you're ready to commit to stand in the hope of Christ with this church, to join us in membership as we endeavor in a work greater than ourselves, building God's kingdom together by following him, come forward and jo join in the work of God by becoming a member of this church.
And at this time, I'm going to pray for us. And then I invite you to come forward during the next song when you're ready. Heavenly Father, Lord God, I thank you for great examples and heroes of the faith who show us that the way forward and that working in your will is not always a straight line. It's sometimes there are hiccups and sometimes there are setbacks and you have a good plan and that you're walking us through each phase of that plan purposefully. That you are a good father and a good provider. That you have a perfect plan that you intend to accomplish your will and that you desire that we would submit to that will. I pray that's what we would do. It's by the aid of your spirit and in the matchless authority of your son, Jesus Christ, to you, Father, we pray. Amen.